detail how this impacts businesses. Now, I'm not going to go into detail, um, and I do not have the, the knowledge to go into detail on the entire stay-at-home order. Our focus here really today is about how the stay-at-home order that comes into effect tomorrow will, be, um, will impact businesses. Um, so if you have any questions about the, how it impacts parks and golf and things like that, please follow up with an email and I can make sure to route your question to the right person. I know that a lot of this conversation about businesses, um, today's focus is really about the um, today's focus is really about the the enforcement of the stay at home order. But I do want to make sure that uh, I talk very briefly, at least about the available funding options for businesses. And finally, um, we are very excited that Dr. Jennifer Su from the City of Chicago Department of Public Health is with us today, and she's going to be presenting and answering questions for the last 15 minutes of this presentation. So any questions that are very specifically health related about face masks or about keeping a workplace healthy and safe, those questions, if you can, please save them for the end and we'll do our best to have Dr. Su answer those questions. I'm also excited to say that um, Andy Fox, the Director of Labor Standards for the City of Chicago is on, us, is on this webinar today as well. Um, he will not be presenting, but if any questions come up related to paid sick leave and other worker protections like that, Andy can um, help answer those questions, or we can follow up answering those questions after the presentation. And another quick thing before I get into the stay at home order, I'm going to give, you know, from BACP's perspective, a really detailed and, and hopefully helpful overview of the stay at home order. I cannot answer questions, you know, about the, the, Governor Pritzker's intention behind the stay at home order. We, we, you know, we know that this is absolutely essential for keeping the life saving progress that we've been making over the last month to keep that going. But, you know, we, I am not the, the governor's office and I'm not the health professional. So I can answer questions about how it works, but I will not be able to answer some, some questions that I'm sure. Great. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into uh, an overview of the existing stay at home order. So as I said, the current stay at home order is in effect through April 30th, 2020. That is today. Again, the stay at home order is in effect through today, April 30th, 2020. Under this existing stay at home order, es only essential businesses can continue operations. Those essential businesses are essential government services, public health operations, stores that sell groceries and medicine, restaurants, however, limited just to carry out, drive through and delivery. Um, essential, re you know, essential businesses like banks, hardware stores, laundry services, transportation and businesses related to transportation, auto shops and bike shops, for example. The full list of essential businesses can be found at on chicago.gov slash coronavirus. Um, but uh, businesses that are not essential, things like gyms, dine-in restaurants, hair and nail salons, entertainment venues, yoga studios, non-essential businesses must stay closed under the existing, again, must stay closed under the stay at home order. Um, non-essential businesses such as those I just mentioned and others, may maintain minimum basic activities. What does that mean? That means maintaining facilities and inventory, maintaining payroll, and allowing for employees to work from home. If a non-essential business could do their entire business with their employees working from home, then they can continue operating. You can learn more about this, again, at chicago.gov slash coronavirus. That's your main go-to place for everything related to COVID-19, including the stay-at-home order. Social distancing is also a part of the stay-at-home order. This means that essential businesses are required, are mandated to maintain social distancing. This is not optional, this is not a suggestion. The stay-at-home order makes it very clear the social distancing requirements that businesses are required to follow. That means designating six-foot distances having hand sanitizer and sanitizing products available, designating separate hours for elderly and vulnerable, and also posting online where, when a facility is open and how somebody 
can contact the business in order to set up a remote, to, in order to learn about when it's open or to get remote purchases, things like that. So again, these are the existing requirements built into the current stay at home order, which again expires today. I'm giving this introduction to the existing stay at home order because for most, for the most part, things are not changing with the new stay at home order. And in fact, I should probably be calling it the modified stay at home order instead of a new stay at home order. That implies that something is drastically different. There are, however, very important changes with the new stay at home order. There is a lot, again, that is very similar. And a lot of the things that I just talked about will still apply under the uh, modified stay at home order. However, there are six main new things, new requirements that I'm going to talk about today. One question we keep getting is, is how do I read the new stay at home order? How do I learn about this? Um, the fact is, it's, it is not yet fully been, um, it's not fully up on the governor's website at this point, but it will be up first thing tomorrow. This, um, so if you wanna read the exact text of the executive order, we do not have that at this point, but we will have that when it comes into effect tomorrow, May 1st, 2020. That's part of the intention why we want to do this webinar. We want to make sure that people are prepared, that businesses know what is going to be happening and know what they should be expecting tomorrow when this order comes into effect, especially if a business needs to change something or has the opportunity to change something under this order. First, I said I was going to talk mostly about how this impacts businesses. But I did want to talk first about the uh, requirement to wear face coverings, which applies under the executive order to everybody, not just specific to businesses. So effective tomorrow, May 1st, all individuals over the age of two will be required to wear a face covering over their nose and mouth when they are in one of these two circumstances in a public space and unable to maintain a six foot social distance or in any indoor public space. So again, anybody over the age of two that can medically tolerate a face covering will be required to wear one in a public space when they're unable to maintain a six foot social distance. That means any sort of outdoor public space if they are within six feet of other people or in any indoor public space. The idea that in an indoor public space, it is very difficult to impossible to um, maintain that six foot social distance. So I give that as, as something that really everybody should know outside of just businesses. Now under the stay at home order on an earlier slide again, I talked about what businesses are considered essential and allowed to stay open. In addition to the existing essential businesses, two new categories are going to be added to that list starting tomorrow. Those are animal, animal grooming services, pet grooming services, and greenhouses, garden centers, and nurseries. So again, these businesses previously were considered non-essential and expected to close under the stay-at-home order. Now, these businesses are considered essential and are able to be open beginning tomorrow. That includes, uh, you know, they're in, now in the same category as banks and auto shops and grocery stores and government services. So they um, now are considered essential and therefore may be open and following all the uh, requirements of being an essential business. That does not mean that they have free reign to do whatever they want. As I said, and as I'll get into a little bit more detail, all essential businesses are required to follow the social distancing requirements um, of the old and the new stay at home order. But again, pet grooming services and greenhouses, garden centers and nurseries are now starting tomorrow considered essential. Right. Additionally, and, and very importantly, and this is key to a lot of businesses that are deemed non-essential, beginning tomorrow, Retail stores that are non-essential may reopen to, to fulfill online or telephone orders. Again, retail stores that are not essential, your beauty supply stores, your clothing stores, shoe stores, places like that that are considered non-essential, 
they may reopen to fulfill online or telephone orders. Importantly, though, people can, um, consumers cannot come into the store. Consumers must, will then, the orders will be fulfilled either by pickup outside of the store or through delivery. Curbside pickup, somebody can come to the store in order to get the item that they've ordered online or over the phone, but they cannot go into the store. This is a new permissible activity for non-essential businesses. This does not mean that retail stores, that general retail can fully reopen and are considered essential. Retail stores are still considered non-essential. However, they may reopen to fulfill online or telephone orders. That means you can bring employees into that store in order to fulfill those purchases. So employees can now be working from the store, again, maintaining social distancing, wearing face masks, and all those other requirements. So um, employees can be in the store, but consumers cannot. Customers cannot enter the store in order to make a purchase or to pick up a purchase. The purchase must be done online or over the phone, and pickup must happen outside of the store, either um, right out front of the door, into a hand, you know hand delivered to a car, something like that, and or they can be fulfilled with delivery. Importantly, existing parking and public way rules must still be followed under this um, change. This, you know, you can still be ticketed for double parking. You can still um, be ticketed for having uh, selling items on the public way. That is still not allowed. So businesses, retail that chooses to reopen, please make sure you're following all the other regulations to make sure that you are not um, breaking the law under this. So uh, when it comes to enforcement here, um, we will be, you know, if, if we go to a retail store that is uh, considered non-essential, and is now allowing for um, people to come into the store, that can and will lead to a citation. Um, but employees in the store is allowed. And again, this, this applies to retail stores. This does not apply to all non-essential businesses, only retail stores. Great. Here is the, the next thing I want to talk about in a little detail is new requirements that all businesses must take in order to protect their employees and consumers. This is a requirement for all businesses, um, whether they are essential, non-essential, whether they're retail or service prov providing services or manufacturing or construction. These are requirements now that all businesses must be taking to protect their employees and consumers. So first, effective May 1st, all businesses are required to take the following steps. First and most importantly, businesses are required to provide employees with face coverings. Employees, this, this obviously does not mean employees that are working from home. This means employees that will be, um, you know, in, in a situation where uh, social distancing is not possible. They will be um, required to provide those employees with face coverings. They're also required to make sure that their employees are wearing these face coverings when they are unable to maintain a six foot distance at all times. So businesses are uh, employees are not required to wear face coverings if they're not in a public place or if they're not um, within six feet. But it is, it is incumbent upon the business, the business is required to make sure that, um, is to, the businesses are required to make sure that employees are wearing face coverings when they're unable to maintain a six foot distance at all times. Additionally, when work circumstances required, if there are situations requiring additional public personal protective equipment or PPE, then the business is required to um, provide that to their employees as well. And another requirement that's spelled out specifically in the stay at home order now, but frankly is something that should be in place um, 
that should be in place and, and should have been, you all should have been doing it and has been strongly encouraged from the beginning is to make sure uh, to evaluate whether employees are able to work from home. Again, this is something that should be done, that should have been done a month and a half ago. But if it has not been, it is now a requirement for businesses that businesses are to evaluate whether employees are able to work from home and to encourage it and to make sure it is happening when possible. I think one thing we have all learned from this is it's easier to work from home than, than I think we all anticipate. You know, I think a lot of folks, uh, even from the city government perspective, have been able to, to work from home as needed. Now, that does not mean that um, essential workers are now required to work from home. It just means that businesses are required to take those steps to evaluate whether employees are able to work from home. Additionally, there's going to be a requirement to post guidance from the Illinois Department of Public Health. Now, I have uh, my understanding is this guidance has not yet been shared from the Department of Public Health, but once it is, um, we'll make sure that that is sent out to our businesses and that our um, investigators are sharing that with, with businesses as well. So again, these are requirements for all businesses. Um, specifically now onto, onto the fifth major category, there are new requirements specifically for retail businesses. So in addition to all those requirements I just talked about on bullet four, um, retail businesses are required to take additional steps. First, they, and, and retail means generally, you know, your general retail businesses. These mean your, your stores that sell goods for, for, um, for uh, customers to take home. So in this category, you know, we're talking about, um, we're, we're talking about hardware stores and grocery stores and, and folks that sell um, other essential items like that. So in addition to the requirements that I just spoke about regarding face coverings and posting, um, posting guidance, um, retail businesses are required to take the following steps. Um, they're required to cap their occupancy at 50% of the store capacity or the occupancy limits for that store. This means grocery stores should be capping their occupancy at 50% of store capacity. And now our understanding is that um, our, our understanding is that many businesses are doing this already, and that is still um, that 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 should and should still continue. But this is something that now is gonna be required under the new stay at home order. Additionally, they're, they're required to set up store aisles to be one way where practicable, where possible. They're required to communicate with customers through in-store signage, public service announcements, and advertisements about uh, the social distancing requirements. And finally, they're required to discontinue the use of reusable bags. Um, now, this is something, again, that I understand most businesses are already doing at this point, but this is something that is now a part of the stay-at-home order to discontinue the use of reusable bags. Now, when it comes to bags, obviously, the city of Chicago has a bag tax. Uh, the city of Chicago has deferred collection of that bag tax to, um, to um, uh, June 1st. However, businesses can and still should be collecting the bag tax from customers. Now it is up to the business whether they want to collect that or whether they want to remit the tax themselves. But uh, at this point, um, the city, the payment for bag tax has been deferred to June 1st, but the collection of the bag, bag tax should not cease at this point. So again, just to emphasize, all retail businesses should be capping their occupancy at 50% setting up store aisles to be one way, communicating with customers about the social distancing requirements, and discontinuing the use of reusable bags. Now, again, our understanding is, is most businesses, many businesses, particularly grocery stores, are already doing this. We know that a lot of retail have been taking their own proactive steps or following recommendations to, um, to uh, do social distancing requirements like this. And uh, we're very encouraged by that. Now, a lot of those things will be mandated under the new stay at home order. Should not be a significant change for many businesses. Finally, in the last section here, 
is specific requirements for manufacturers in order to protect their employees. Again, in addition to, in addition to those requirements in um, number four that I talked about uh, a couple slides ago, manufacturing businesses are required to take additional steps beginning tomorrow where possible. They're required to stagger their shifts and reduce line speeds and to evaluate which lines are the most essential ones and shutting down non-essential lines. So the intention of this is to make sure that for employees um, that there aren't a significant um, uh, that that there aren't uh, significant cases in which um, employer em, employees are within six feet and um, unable to maintain those social distancing requirements. They're required to ensure that all spaces where employees may gather, which includes locker rooms, lunchrooms, anything else like that, allow for social distancing. So that six foot social distancing requirement, that's not just for customers and consumers, that's for employees, it's particularly manufacturing, now have additional requirements beyond other businesses. And then they should be downsizing to the extent necessary to allow for social distancing. This is absolutely essential. We, you know, we, we don't want to see, excuse me, we don't want to see reports of employees, you know, packed in closely at manufacturing plants. While manufacturers are considered essential, there are steps that all manufacturers should be taking in order to maintain social distancing and to maintain safety at their location. So those are the main new changes under the stay at home order. Really quickly, I want to talk about enforcement, and I know we have some of our investigators here on this line, um, and they're, they've been doing an incredible job enforcing this because the mayor's made it clear, the governor's made it clear, this is not optional. This is not suggestions. These are not guidelines. These are things that are absolute requirements for businesses, and we can and will be taking citations. Citations to date have been issued to 69 different businesses around the city of Chicago. We have been enforcing the stay at home order and we will continue to enforce the stay at home order. The time for education, um, you know, we're, we're doing what we can to educate folks, but the time for education really is over. And I know there's new changes under the stay at home order, but businesses that have been deemed non-essential since March, 30, March 21st do not, should not have an excuse that they do not know. We've been hosting numerous webinars. We've been sharing this information publicly and our investigators have made over 11,000 calls directly to businesses. You should not at this point have any questions about the current stay at home order. Now we understand obviously there are changes coming into effect tomorrow and that's what, um, and that's the important thing here. So, um, Violations, um, citations for violating the um, stay at home order can lead to fines of up to $10,000. Citations can include, most common one, a non essential business staying open. That means um, up until today, any uh, you know, general retail that's not essential, any gym, yoga studio, to tobacco shop, places like that staying open. And then again, most of those retail tomorrow can um can reopen for online purchases um uh can reopen for online purchases but they should not be having customers inside and if we our investigators visit a business and see customers inside at a non-essential retail that can and will lead to a citation um We've received over 2,700 complaints re regarding non-essential businesses staying open. So this is something that we're taking seriously. Addis additionally, we have and we will continue to issue citations for essential businesses that fail to follow social distancing. This means, again, mandating um, the, you know, designating six foot distances, having separate hours for the elderly and vulnerable. Um, and also now requiring on providing masks to businesses. And finally, restaurants and bars allowing dine-in. If we show up at a restaurant, again, restaurants can stay open for delivery and pickup, but restaurants, bars, if we show up and someone's waiting for their food and sitting down and drinking a beer, that's not okay. 
That is a citation that is failing to follow the, the rules of this. No dine-in for food or for beverage. Before I move on, I've had a couple questions come through and I apologize for not getting to them during this, but I'm gonna take a couple minutes to answer a couple of these questions coming through. So when I talk about retail, um, and retail that is, a, that is considered non-essential, but is now allowed to open for purchases as long as the customers stay outdoors. We're really talking about anything where a customer can make a purchase and take that purchase home. Um, if the customer needs to come inside for a service, for example, then that is not considered retail and they would not be able to, to, to reopen for online purchases. For example, a massage establishment where you need to go in in order to get the massage, that would not qualify as being able to open under the new retail requirement. Um, an art gallery, for example, where you walk in and, and view the art, you cannot open to allow folks to be walking around inside. Now, if you're an art gallery that sells art, you can, you can now do online purchases and have folks, um, and have folks uh, arrive at your store in order to pick up that purchase. Again, they cannot be coming in. Um, I, heard, I have a question about determining occupancy limits. Um, that is something that the Illinois uh, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity will be sharing, and we'll make sure to share that guidance with you um, shortly. I had a question about uh, frame shop allowing customers one at a time to come in. Non-essential businesses cannot allow customers into their business. That is, want to be very, very clear about that. If you are a non-essential business, you cannot allow customers to enter your business, even if it is one at a time, even if there are, is social distancing being followed under that. Um, customers may make online purchases, may make over the phone purchases, but they cannot enter the store in order to pick up, to select anything, to make a purchase, anything like that. I had a question about the city or state providing uniform signage for these changes. Um, the, uh, again, my understanding is the Illinois Department of Public Health will be providing signage. I understand that, as that, uh, that is uniform and that is part of the requirement. That is something that we will be passing on to businesses as soon as that is, that is ready to go. Uh, um, I saw a question come through about this webinar being made available. Um, we will be, we are recording this webinar, and I will make sure that, uh, and it will be posted on YouTube and on our city of Chicago, um, our, sorry, chicago.gov slash business workshops page. Great. Had some questions about uh, using the public way for curbside pickup. So um, anything, any sort of purchasing, any sort of business activity on the public way, um, does require a permit and does require a license. So you you are not under this change. You're not allowed to just kind of move your store outside um, in order to uh, in in order to now have purchasing and things like that outside. I'll be happy. And as this question came in, I'd be happy uh, if you send an email to BACP Outreach to pass along some of the specific guidelines on that. But it is very important and incumbent upon the business to make sure that um, the, the curbside pickup is not breaking traffic laws and is not, um, and is not uh, having an impact on um, the, the public way. So a question about folks from outside of the city of Chicago. So, um, so the, the stay at home order applies statewide. So the things that I'm talking about today are relevant to um, folks outside of the city of Chicago as well. Now, there is some minor details that might be different and enforcement might be a little bit different in different locations. So I would recommend that you reach out to your local municipality for any kind of specific questions. Um, a question about whether, uh, so at the challenge of getting masks. One thing I wanna say about face coverings, and again, we have Dr. Sa on who's gonna join in just a couple minutes. Face coverings don't necessarily mean masks. They can mean really anything that covers your nose and your mouth. Um, if, if employees do have their own masks and are, and are able to, to wear those, then that is okay. Um, the city of Chicago and the mayor's office is working 
um, diligently to, to get masks out and to and we'll be sharing information shortly about mask giveaways. Uh, the mayor has announced over a million masks that will be distributed um, and that will be coming soon and we'll make sure that businesses are um, um, that, that businesses are uh, available to um, get to, to follow up there. Great. So uh, I see a couple more questions coming in. I wanna very quickly get to available funding supports before uh, I answer some of those questions um, and then pass it off to Dr. Sutt to answer some specific health questions and to walk through health guidance. First, again, today is all about the stay at home order, but I wanna make sure that folks are aware of the different funding opportunities because we know, believe me, we know that asking businesses and requiring businesses to close or to change their um, process during this time is incredibly challenging. So I wanna provide an overview of the available funding supports. So right now, and most importantly, the US Small Business Administration, the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program is currently accepting applications. There was a first round of funding a few weeks ago, they ran out of money very quickly, and they re-upped it, and starting this Monday, they are accepting applications. This is really and truly your best option for getting funding. We know that a lot of people had some trouble the first time around, and the SBA made some changes in their program to make sure that this time around, um, there will be more, it'll be more accessible to more folks. They've set aside, I believe, $60 billion to be funded through community groups. We've also made sure that um, businesses are able to use not just your major lending sources, but also online lending sources. You could apply through PayPal, things like that. Um, so please check out the Paycheck Protection Program through your preferred lender. Additionally, we announced it two days ago. Uh, the Chicago Micro Business Recovery Grant Program is going to be providing $5,000 grants to up to 1,000 businesses with four or fewer employees that are located in certain low and moderate income neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. That application is available and will be available until this upcoming Monday, just Monday, May 4th. Um, so please get your application in as soon as possible. That will be distributed via a lottery. Finally, a lot of uh, private organizations are doing their own grants or loan programs. So one in particular we want to refer you to is Facebook. Facebook has set aside $1.25 million for the Chicago area for small businesses to receive grants. So please check out the Facebook Small Business Grant Program. Additionally, the, U, the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan, they are um, they're processing applications. They're not accepting applications anymore, but they're processing existing applications. And also the City of Chicago Small Business Resiliency Loan Fund also closed the applications, but are continuing to process applications. So if you have a loan application in for the Resiliency Fund, we understand that um, folks are, are wanting to know um, the status of their loan. We are working through those applications and we should be providing updates soon. Um, one also thing, additional thing I wanna talk about is something new that we just announced a couple weeks ago. Uh, the city created the Small Business Resource Navigators. These are 13 community organizations that are specifically activated and specifically trained to provide one-on-one -on -one funding, financial and business support to businesses throughout the city of Chicago. Um, they're located in neighborhoods all around the city. You can visit chicago.gov slash BACP COVID-19 for information about those resource navigators and um, for any uh, additional uh, questions and information about business resources during this time. Great. Um, so let me see if there's any additional questions that have came in. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions about the stay at home order. Um, so uh, I'm going to pass it along. Uh, Dr. Su, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Great. So again, we are very, very excited. Uh, she's incredibly busy and doing such incredible work for the city. But uh, Dr. Jennifer Su from the Chicago Department of uh, Public Health, she's a medical director at um, CDPH. And she's here to just, if anybody has anything, any specific health questions or 
um, anything that related to uh, the CDPH guidance for businesses. Dr. So is going to quickly walk through the workplace setting guidance and then um, answer any questions that people have. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. So. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone is staying healthy. I just wanted to go over the workplace guidance uh, for businesses. Um, it hasn't changed, uh, but now that there will be more uh, businesses open with the uh, new stay at home order, um, helpful to go over these uh, these uh, public health guidelines. So the first guideline um, addresses how to reduce transmission among employees uh, who are coming into your workplace. So the most important thing is to ensure that sick employees are at home. So uh, make sure everyone is aware of your sick policies and practices. Um, and if anyone is at the workplace and they're showing symptoms, send them home right away and make it, um, uh, I guess, an environment or culture where someone can say, hey, I'm not feeling well, I need to go home. Um, and so that they can go home uh, again immediately. Um, again, implement policies and practices for social distancing. Uh, I do want to emphasize that the cloth face coverings, um, they are an additional measure. They do not replace the importance of doing that physical distancing, maintaining good hand hygiene, not touching your face. So it's an additional measure, it does not replace all of the other preventive things that we've been talking about through this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it's good to just have a plan in place for possible exposure to COVID-19 in the workplace. So um, whether that is um, a patron that you uh, discover had COVID um, or um, more likely uh, an employee who uh, is diagnosed with COVID-19, make sure that um, you have a plan in place for how you're going to identify close contacts and uh, keep people home who need to stay at home. The second part is about maintaining um, healthy business operations. So uh, there will be questions, things to coordinate. It's helpful to have someone in your workplace who is identified as the point person for COVID-19 related issues. Like I mentioned before, having flexible leave policies and supportive policies is very important because we want to ensure that employees feel that they can take leave without um, having to worry about anything else, that they can stay at home or leave the workplace if necessary to take care of themselves or uh, family members. And then um, make sure that you're assessing your essential functions and what reliance you have on others um, and, the, um, and how the community relies on you for your services and products. Um, so you can kind of prioritize uh, certain products or certain services that you're doing um, to those that you know will have the greatest impact on your community. Um, and finally, maintain a healthy work environment. So uh, take into consideration your ventilation system. Make sure there's good air exchange. Uh, if you have um, old filters, make sure to change them out because um, as you may be aware, COVID-19 um, is thought to primarily be transmitted through those respiratory droplets when someone coughs or sneezes or talks. And so you want to make sure you're able to filter out whatever may be in the air. Um, make sure that you're promoting um, uh, good hand hygiene in the workplace, reminding people about good respiratory etiquette or respiratory hygiene. That just means making sure people are covering their coughs and sneezes, uh, washing or cleaning their hands after they use any kind of tissues, things like that. Everyone can always use a reminder. Um, make sure that you have cleaning protocols in place. So uh, routine daily cleaning of the workspace, disinfection of high touch surfaces, and then doing some kind of enhanced cleaning and disinfection if you happen to have someone in the workplace who is diagnosed with COVID-19. And um, this probably isn't happening that much anymore, um, but if uh, you know that employees are um, traveling for whatever reason, if they have to uh, leave for any reason to take care of a sick family member elsewhere, you know that um, people are coming and just advise employees about taking extra precautions and preparations, but that is less of a concern right now with the same orders um, across the nation. We can go to slide.
what should you do if a staff member employee but so this would really affect a folks in her player use with the individual to determine when their start of symptoms was um, and then you'd want to uh, let fellow employees know of possible exposure um, and in particular the important thing is to identify close contacts so um, those who are within that uh, Within six feet of that employee for more than 10 minutes would be considered a close contact. Um, you would want to ask those employees to stay home for 14 days from the last day they were in contact with the positive individual. You want to make sure that you're going to perform enhanced cleaning and disinfection after you've identified that um, one of your employees has uh, been diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, so if you weren't disinfecting certain services and you know the employee was in that workspace, you want to make sure that you are you clean and disinfect the area, any areas where the employee was at. Next slide. Um, Dr. So can you just repeat that, um, the, the definition of what direct close contact means? Yes, yes. So a close contact is anyone who has been within six feet for over 10 minutes of the person diagnosed with COVID-19. It really is thought that the, again, most transmission of COVID-19 happens with that close contact. Um, so if someone just walked past someone else, um, that is not considered to be um, a risk for transmission at all. Or if someone was further away, um, more than six feet away from someone, um, not of concern. So again, within six feet for over 10 minutes, those are considered close contacts of that individual who was diagnosed with COVID-19. Those individuals um, would need to be asked to self-quarantine at home for 14 days from the last day they were in contact with the positive individual. Okay, thank you. And then also another question that came through is, um, is should CDPH, should the health department be contacted at some point um, when this happens as well? So um, the, an employer does not need to contact CDPH. And the reason being that all labs and hospitals and all providers are required to report anytime they have uh, someone who has po tested positive for COVID-19. So an employer does not need to reach out to CDPH to let the providers, um, the labs will be doing. All right, so this is just um, guidance for critical infrastructure workers. So um, you'll see here some examples of critical infrastructure workers. So, uh, you know, federal, state, government, law enforcement, 911 centers, um, but also includes workers, for example, grocery store workers, pharmacy workers, um, those in transportation, um, energy, information technology, manufacturing, critical manufacturing. Um, if an employer uh, in one of these critical infrastructure um, uh, industries uh, got to a point where they did not have enough employees who could uh, um, work to maintain operations because of um, everyone being out with COVID-19 or needing to self-quarantine because they are close contacts of someone with COVID-19. Um, CDPH and CDC um, has guidelines saying that Critical infrastructure workers may be permitted to continue working following a potential exposure to COVID-19 as long as they are asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any symptoms of COVID-19. But there are additional precautions that need uh, to be taken. And you can find these on our website, chicago.gov slash coronavirus. But they would include things like the um, exposed workers would need to wear a mask, which now is required, but they would need to wear a mask um, for 14 days uh, after exposure. But again, uh, everyone's required to wear a mask, so that should be an easy requirement to, to fill. And then um, doing a, a symptom screening, temperature check and symptom screening on these workers before they arrive for their shift to ensure that um, they have no symptoms, they have no fever, that they are healthy to come into work. Um, but just um, guidance that's out there um, because, again, critical infrastructure workers are very important to maintain city operations. Um, 
and to be there for our city. So there is additional guidance to allow for those exposed workers to continue working. But again, there are additional precautions that must be taken to ensure that um, it's a safe thing to do. Great, uh, and thanks, Doctor. So one follow up question: um, Should should businesses? This is getting back to to the previous slide. Should businesses be providing you know advice? Should they encourage employees that are sick to follow up with their healthcare provider? Um, you know, what when is is there any sort of specific recommendations around that end? Um, provided since you know the employer the employers are not contacting CDPH. Right. So. Um... In general, if someone is ill, so I guess one thing to know is that over 80% of individuals with COVID-19 will have mild symptoms and they will recover and be able to take care of themselves at home. So um, we generally say if you have mild symptoms, if you are under the age of 60, you don't have underlying health conditions, you can safely self-treat at home. Um, don't necessarily need to reach out to a healthcare provider. If an employee um, or anyone is over the age of 60, um, have underlying health conditions, even if their symptoms are mild, we do recommend reaching out to their healthcare providers um, just to touch base to see if an in person office visit is needed, whether they need to come in for testing. Um, but, uh, and then of course, if anyone has severe symptoms or more significant symptoms, they should reach out to their doctor or call 911 or go to the emergency room. Great, thank you. And then Dr. So could you talk briefly about uh, face coverings and why, um, you know, there's obviously this change coming in, um, requiring them tomorrow. Can you talk very briefly just at a high level about the importance of face coverings and why, um, why this change in guidance? Right, so um, again, um, it's very important that everyone is doing their physical distancing, good hand hygiene, not washing their face. The reason we um, have recommended face coverings is because uh, as we learn more about this novel coronavirus, uh, we are finding that um, there is um, uh, from individuals who don't have symptoms of COVID-19, either they're in early stages of the infection and they haven't exhibited symptoms yet, or some people just actually never develop any symptoms, but they're still transmitting the virus. So the purpose of the face coverings is to actually prevent transmission of the virus from the wearer, um, and especially for those who may not realize that they have the virus. So the face covering captures those respiratory droplets that come out when we cough, sneeze, or talk, um, and the purpose is to prevent transmission from the wearer to other people. So um, it's not, the purpose of these face coverings are not to directly protect the wearer from infection, but it will reduce workplace hazard. Um, Cause if you think about it, if everyone is wearing a face covering, transmission of virus from everybody, you know, each individual uh, is gonna be reduced. And so overall, everyone's gonna be in a safer environment. Um, particularly important if you're within that six foot distance, if you can't maintain that six foot distance, because the respiratory droplets that come out, um, uh, we have found really can't travel past six feet. But if you're within that six foot distance, you want to make sure something is covering your mouth and your nose so those droplets don't get out. But again, doesn't replace that physical distancing good hand hygiene. But in those situations where you're not going to be able to maintain that over six foot distance, a face covering is um, recommended. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Sa. Um, we had a couple of questions come in. Um, Andy, are you uh, on the webinar at this point? So there were a couple of questions that have come in uh, specifically related, and I think Andy's trying to, to join in so he can um, uh, answer some of these questions. A couple of questions come in specifically related to, to what to do if, and Andy, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes. So we have a couple questions. Uh, first, and this, if you don't know, if you don't have an exact answer, at least a recommendation for what um, businesses should do if they're following all the social guidance and um, employer employees are refusing to come into work or are still concerned. What what are some recommendations there? Um, you know, this is an area. 
where we're seeing more of this exact, you know, we see employers that are doing a very conscientious job. I, I was reviewing a few letters today. The employer said, listen, we encourage you to use whatever time. We're going to be flexible. We're going to work with you. And the employee was saying, I, you know, I don't really have a medical diagnosis, but I don't want to come in. I'm concerned. And they said, listen, and this was a few weeks out. You're going to be returning to work on this day. Um, please reach out to us. And so between the two of them, we were telling the employee, listen, if you do have a medical condition or something to assert, you, you need to give the employer some information about it. Otherwise, um, they might be in a position to have to lay you off. They're trying to get you to come to work and they're working with you. And, and that's what the decent and good employers are doing. Employees choose not to come to work then you know we're encouraging employees to be flexible but at some point if they don't show up to work if they refuse to show up to work because of a general concern you you could issue discipline on them and or it could move toward termination depending on the kind of policies and handbook uh, that you have in place for employees uh great i apologize i, I should have gone on mute i know that was a little equity for some folks um, Dr. So, if you're still there, and I know we're wrapping up in just a couple minutes, I apologize. Some questions came in through the uh, Q&A, and we were only tracking the chat, so I'll do my best to answer some of these questions quickly. Dr. So, would um, a like a mask suffice for face coverings, or um, would you would folks still be required to wear some sort of mask underneath that? Sorry, like a, a face shield. I mean, would a face shield suffice? for face coverings, or is there still a recommendation to wear uh, some sort of face covering under that? So a face shield wouldn't be enough. Um, the face coverings, we want them to be snug against the side of the face. Um, face shields are open, so um, uh, you could still have droplets you know, coming out the side. I mean, the same thing with face coverings, but really um, you would need a, a face covering, again, that's snug against the side of the face um, so that, uh, Again, the purpose is to keep in those respiratory droplets. So you would need to put on a face covering um, underneath some kind of face shield. I guess it might depend on what the face shield looks like, but I'm thinking of it's face shields that we use in the medical setting. Um, but a, a mask would be needed because you need something a little bit snugger against the face. Great, thanks, Dr. So. And uh, one question I see coming through uh, around massage establishments. Um, nothing has changed regarding the requirement for uh, massage establishments. Um, they are still considered non-essential businesses unless the massage treatment is being performed pursuant to a physician's order. Um, we are at uh, five o'clock. I know there's some additional questions coming in, so I, I do apologize. Um, we have not been able to answer every single question. I do please ask folks to um, submit those questions to BACP outreach at cityofchicago.org. We'll do our best to get those questions answered as quickly as possible, and we'll forward the, the health ones on to the health department. Um, so I apologize if your questions came in through the Q&A. Um, we were not tracking that as closely as the chat throughout this process. So please do follow up with those questions via email, and we'll look to get you an answer as soon as possible. Um, thank you all for attending this webinar, and I especially want to thank Dr. Suh for taking her time to, to help answer a couple questions and to walk uh, folks through this guidance. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Suh, and keep up um, all the life-saving work that you guys are doing over at the health department. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stay well, everyone. And thanks again to all the attendees. Uh, I hope, again, I apologize for some of the questions that were unable to, to be answered. Please do feel free to send those questions uh, via email to BACPoutreach at cityofchicago.org. Thank you.